Are low interest rates impacting on your investment returns? It's time to rethink. Rethink Investing creates wealth for clients through the strategic purchase of positively geared, high cash flow commercial property. Industrial properties, retail assets or office spaces can be a smart investment option that produces significant and long-term return on investment. Rethink your investment options and look to commercial property. Learn more at rethinkinvesting.com.au. Rethink Investing, Australia's number one commercial buyer's agency. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Oh, good day, everyone. How are you going? Uh, welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show. A uh, bit of a treat today. It, we've been um, tuning in to a lot of the feedback we've been getting, and I must admit I'm absolutely blown away right now by just the level of engagement on the Smart Property Investment uh, platform, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, and it's good. I like to think that um, you know the work that we're doing here, trying to help property investors make more informed decisions, is really resonating, and traffic on the website is off the charts. Yes, a lot of that's going to be driven by the sentiment, uh, bullish sentiment in property right now, and people are out there trying to be as informed as possible. So that's a big tick for us. But particularly on the Smart Property Investment Show, the narrative around giving a real-world view on investing in property, how to go about doing it without the bias that you may get and are likely to get in some parts of the world in that property spruikers or people may be with an agenda to steer in a particular direction. That's not us. We're a broad church here and my job is to make sure that you get a very measured view by tuning into this particular podcast. So some people do claim a particular bias from us here. You'll get people maybe giving me a hard time about not talking about all the benefits of off-the-plan purchases. You'll get people talking about, I don't give enough emphasis on house, brand new house and land packages. Uh, you'll get other people, you know, giving me a hard time saying that um, we're operating at the wrong end of the market. You know, my response to that is we're very fortunate that we can connect in with, I guess, both property investors and also consultants and professionals from right across the sector. And I try and give the blended view, I believe, of what all the best operators are doing. So that essentially steers our philosophy and how we approach it. And one of the things that we do do uh, very well, I believe, is the investor story. So we try as much as possible to get investors in the studio to tell us their story. Sometimes they don't want to give too much away, and it's my job really to try and extract that information as effectively as possible. And if you want to come and have a chat with us, we're getting a lot of interest at the moment, but get in touch with the team, uh, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. If you want to come and have a chat on the podcast, it's pretty easy stuff to sort out. We can do it no matter where you are. You could be in Aspen, Colorado somewhere, and you're an Aussie property investor, we can make that happen over the marvels. That is the worldwide interweb. And that's pretty cool. That's really helping us to democratize uh, the whole uh, smart property investment platform and make sure we have a view and a voice from all sectors of the property market industry and the investors, new, old, indifferent to uh, property, large portfolios, small portfolios. But another big pillar of the Smart Property Investment Show is leveraging our network uh, of professionals that operate within property. Uh, real estate agents, buyers, agents, accountants, property strategists, conveyances, pest and building providers, demographers, property economists, property platform providers, uh, the whole supply base that underpins property investors. We get them in, we have a chat with them, and uh, I try and work out exactly where their skill sets are and try and steer the narrative in a conversation around extracting the best information I can from them to um, be of benefit to you, our listeners. So today's going to be very much one of those. It's one of our regular guests on the show, Paul Glossop, Director of Pure Property Investment. I've got him to do his homework, though, before rocking up. Uh, and I've asked him, and the brief was, uh, I want three scenarios of properties that you've secured in this current market. So there's a lot of buyers and agents out there that'll tell you all the great properties they've secured in earlier markets. I said, it's got to be in here and now. It's got to give context to how we're operating as a property market at this point in time. So we're going to get through three case studies, proper case studies, real world case studies, the nuts and bolts, the facts and figures, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and we're going to get into it. And I'm really looking forward to it. So hold on, we're going to do a lot more of this. And if you're into your numbers and you're into your strategy and you're into your tactics and you're that way inclined, this is the episode for you. Paul, how are you going? Well, well I'm very well, mate. And I was disappointed that there wasn't a backhanded remark as part of that introduction because I thought you really set me up for a quick okay. – <laughs> and, and I've got someone in the studio today. I don't quite know why. <laughs> well, <laughs> 
the, you know what? I'm, I'm getting a bit of reputation for that. I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to look. You know, just yeah. trying to just a bloke trying to run a podcast. You know, leave me <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> I'll find someone else to come in who, no, who fair actually enough. who fair actually uh, who actually is, uh, looks forward to it rather than feels it a hindrance. But um, <laughs> how does it work? How does it work for you? By the way, this podcast is it good. Like, you know, you come on a fair bit, so you must yeah. enjoy doing it. You know, Phil, you, you started this podcast a long time ago now because you knew that you, this is basically what you were doing in your pastime anyway, it was having these barbecue chats or chats with clients in and around smartpropertyinvestment.com.au mm. or the Greater Momentum Media brand. And I could dare say that's probably what led to saying, well, why don't we turn these into stories? And I basically do the same thing for a living. And if I didn't like it, to be perfectly honest, I don't need to do it. Mm. So <laughs> it's one of those things where I actually enjoy it. And I really enjoy the fact that this allows so many more people. And the amount of feedback I personally get, and not just about me being on this podcast, but just about your podcast in general, is that it just informs people and it makes people better investors and I know that's basically the mission of this podcast and that's to be fair to aside from me being on it I personally think that people get such a better outcome from it so I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be a part of it and have been a part of it for mm. such a long time thank you knowledge and uh, I do appreciate that it's, um, yeah you're absolutely right I have so many of these conversations and I'm not going to claim the origin of this podcast it was actually one of our colleagues here Andrew Scott that went hey we should be doing podcasts in proper now I sort of sat there and, think of, and thought about it and I went yeah you know I have so many conversations around property. Let's bloody record the thing, and then it just makes it more accessible to everyone. Like That's it. you know, I'm in a fortunate position. I could pick up the phone and speak to anyone in Australia about property. Yeah, you know, it's cool. It it's is a cool. good thing to do. So down that pathway, of democratization of information, making sure that people are better informed. Why not record it? And uh, I like to think that my ability to steer property based conversations are better now than what they were back when we kicked off the podcast. But by and large, it's still the same inherent focus, and that is raw, organic conversations around property. And then really, you know, my job as a podcaster is to listen and people tell me stuff and then I go, oh, that's, that's of interest and being a bit curious at, and then sort of digging down into that. So your homework was to go away and find three locations that you can give me real world case studies. Now, a couple of rules of engagement, Paul, I'm not going to ask you who the client is, but yep. I'm going to ask you some information around the client. So yep. feel comfortable as much as you are yep. and, and can be to give us those information. But I don't want anyone to be able to link anything to anyone. Yeah, right? definitely. The reason why we built a portfolio in Smart Property Investment was so we could be that person. We could identify ourselves yeah. with it. So, But give us what you can without yep. compromising any client privileges, number one. Number two, give us all the information. And yep. I don't want just all the good shit. Yep. Part of my French, I want the whole kit and yeah, caboodle. Definitely. So no doubt you've given me three examples, which are probably pretty good. Maybe, maybe not, but three different examples in three different states at different ends of the market. And we're going to chat about Kalunga. Ka Kalunga? Kalunga. Kalanga. 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 Get your Aussie on. Kalanga in Queensland, uh, Kings Meadow, which is in Tassie in uh, Longceston, and also Woolaware, which is a suburb of the Sutherland Shire. Yep, Got correct. That right? Yep, just uh, behind Cronulla. Behind Cronulla in New South Wales. So we'll go from most affordable to Least affordable, if that's such a thing. It is. Uh, <laughs> Kalanga. I've got property in Kalanga. I know you do. <laughs> I still can't say <laughs> it. <laughs> you, I'm watching you try to say it and you're very hesitant. It's Just really to relax, relax and say it. <laughs> Kalanga. It's really funny and, and I'm really <laughs> conscious about this because I, I do a lot of talking, right? <laughs> I do a lot of talking and I, and I talk a lot on air so it's recorded and people listen to it. And I don't know. Maybe people think I'm an idiot. But there's a handful of words I cannot say. <laughs> like I can't say Tra trajectory? <laughs> tra tra I can't say. I'm not going to laugh. Trajectory? <laughs> I struggled the other day <laughs> when I was chatting with someone. A person who's in logistics is a logistician. <laughs> <laughs> like there's a handful of words, so I just so I deliberately avoid. I deliberately avoid them. Everyone's got them. You must. Have, oh, right, well, you, you must have some words you can't say. Probably. Well, well, it's definitely like, not. Nuclear. It's definitely you're not. Saying, saying nuclear. 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 <laughs> anyway, Kalanga. Kalanga, there Kalanga, you go. Queensland, Relax into it. Which is around the new Sunshine Coast campus, mm -hmm. which is built or getting built? Definitely built. Stage one was live last year. Yep. That's a three to five year process that they'll go through multiple stages and multiple intakes. I think mm. at max, they're sort of talking about 10,000 student university, the Sunshine Coast University Petri campus. Yeah. And there's potentially a big corporate headquarters as well as you know, other attachments that are going to be built yeah. on that campus. So, so if you well. listen to this and you're not driving your car, I know a lot of you are, just Google the campus so you can get a feel for what we're talking about mm. here. And Kalanga is to the north of the campus and to the 
west of the campus, I'm thinking by memory, is Petrie, and then yep. just south of that is Lawnton. So there's a train line yep. that hooks around like a, a curve yep. north through Lawton, Petrie, then it hooks around to the east and it hooks yep. into Kalunga. So yeah, I've got Kalunga. a couple of places. Both the places I've got in, in Kalunga, one's a duplex and one's a a high set, I guess you'd call it, yep. are within walking distance of the campus. Yep. So an example of purchasing here, I bought there in 2017, 18, yep. probably, uh, which is probably a good time to buy. Tell us about this property, Paul. Look, just to make that comment that you said, yeah, it's a good time to buy, 2017, 18. Anyone who's looking to buy in around the North Brisbane, Moreton Bay region or Brisbane in general right now will probably be able to attest to the fact if you're listening to this, you'll know that that market is red hot. And I know you've talked a lot on this podcast about when's it going to go, when's it going to go, mm. it's going. And the reality is, is that it's always at these times where you say, I was a genius because I bought a few years ago. And it's so easy when mm. you look at it in hindsight so, property. See, I, I wasn't a genius. My buyer's agent, which wasn't you, told yep. me to buy this. <laughs> and, they, and you knew who they are and they probably listen to this. So, and I'm good buddies with them yeah, as well. They're the genius. Yeah, yeah. No. Right and, property group. Yeah. And it's funny because I know a few other buyer's agents who have bought in around and we were all buying relatively similar properties in that area at a similar time when we knew, and again, experience in the market nationally, knowing what are the things that are going to move markets, when are they going to move, when's the right time to buy. And unfortunately, too often I see people just get a bit antsy to think, oh, the market hasn't moved for five years, so therefore it's a bad time to buy. To be fair, that's probably one of the better times to get in there. But digging a bit deeper into this particular property, not dissimilar to the high set that you own in Kalanga itself, mm. this property we bought and settled on only about two and a half months ago. The property is not a high set. It's a single story, a fibro, timber and clad home, really dead flat block. So it's in the next gen zoning. Effectively, what that means for anyone who's in any other markets, it's effectively probably the equivalent of medium density, which allows for about one dwelling every 200 square meters. So this particular property was about 650 square meters, dead rectangular block, walking distance to both the train line and university. We paid in the end for the actual property $335,000, which anyone listening to this right now and go and look at properties for sale in Klango Freestanding will know that that's really, really cheap. The property is off market. The intention and probably one of the big things is that because we've only relatively recently settled on this property, to be fair, the property has skyrocketed in value. And it's not necessarily to say that we're geniuses. We did buy it off market. The property was owned by a person who went into a retirement village. We bought it through an agent. They had this property lined up for the last couple of years, more or less ready to go once they actually got their, their place in that retirement village. They moved out. We got the call. We bought it literally the same day. We had the contracts ready to go. We've already got a granny flat approved on that property, and that is going to be under construction probably by the end of March. The intention of this particular property is a 10-year hold, and it's going to go from a will be rented, sorry, at $350 a week. So $335 purchase price. It is neat as a pin, nothing to do. Renting for $350, so well over a 5% gross yield. But the intention is we've got a fixed price contract for 99 grand for a granny flat build, two bedrooms, going to have side access and separate fencing. So you've got a front house with a front yard. Back house is going to be rented at about $290 a week. We expect that construction will start in about a month's time, finish in three months' time. Total rent for that particular property is expected to be around about 620, 630 combined. Now, the intention of this property is to develop it in about 20 years. So this person's going to hold it highly cash flow positive. It's already got higher density zoning than what we're going to put on it, but they want to increase their cash flow so they can recycle into other assets and build up their actual position. So they're already going to be cash flow positive on the house without doing anything. They'll be highly cash flow positive after the granny flat, which we're coordinating for them. And then within the next probably 12 months, that property is going to be about five to $8,000 a year cash flow positive. About 10, 15 years time, they're going to consider whether they go down the pathway of a three townhouse development and it's already zoned for that. What's the zoning like in Kalinga? Um, so Moreton Bay Regional Council in general, if you're looking at sort of the equivalence of low density, medium density, high density, yeah. uh, Kalanga, Petrie, probably not Marumba Downs when you start to turn the corner, but you go further down towards the Morton Bay Peninsula, you've got other markets around Mango Hill, you've got markets around Kipper Ring. Yep. There's areas there which have already been isolated to look at high density zoning and i.e. four stories, five stories. That is happening now. Kalanga has got a couple of pockets mm. that are happening that way, but are probably more importantly already zoned that way by a council, which happened about 18 to 24 months ago. So I know you've got some exposure in those areas as well. And I personally see it, and I've seen it in other markets, Sydney, Melbourne, over towards the, the West Coast as well, which 
the zoning changes, it doesn't mean that things go up literally the yeah. next year. You're usually talking a five, seven, 10 year horizon before you start to actually see that high density development. So we expect it's going to be more that time frame. Okay. So what was the brief that you got? So tell us about the client. Where are they on their property journey? So first investment, they've got a principal place of residence. They had about 180 odd grand's worth of equity available. This was going to be one of two investments that they wanted to get involved in. So they dragged out equity, looking at two investments sub 400K. They were looking at 20% deposit plus closing costs. This property was going to fit that first one. So we're looking for that second property right now for them in the Perth market to get some diversification. So they're looking at getting exposure, sitting tight for another two years. Ideally, if they get the growth out of this run that they expect, we're going to then drag out some equity and then go again probably within that three to four year time frame. Total exposure, they're wanting to get to four assets plus their principal place of residence within five years. And are they chasing a number for retirement on- They're chasing two mil exposure mm. uh, as far as investments, not their principal place of residence. And they've got about 22, 23 years between now and retirement. So the reality is, is that we'll probably maximize this property. It's going to add more cash flow. I think they'll probably end up getting to- 2 million exposure, ideally circa 100K gross in income. Mm. And then probably at some stage, we're going to be halfway paid down by that 22, 23 year time frame. And then by that time, once we're halfway paid down, we're probably looking at selling one asset, retaining three, possibly four if they develop, which will be about 70 to 80 grand's worth of income. And what year are they looking to retire at? So that'll be- like, like how old? How old? So I think they're wanting to push it to around about 60. So okay. So they're, they're sort of in their- yeah, late, late 30s. 30s late, late 30s. 30s. Yeah, so a classic couple with two kids. Yep. Um, already had their home for about seven years and they are in- How that, much debt on their home? Oh, it was about 600K, okay. a vow of about a mil. Yeah. And that's where they're dragging out that sort of circa 200K for those two separate investments. Okay. And they're located in- Sydney. Sydney. Okay. And the brief to you was- that's what we want to achieve. Yeah, go so, away and find out. Well, we firstly we started with structuring. How yeah. do we actually get the starting point? Because they actually were wanting to figure out how do we get to the point of figuring out how do we get the finances structured okay. correctly first. So that was the first step, getting them structured most effectively, both from a tax effective position as well as ensuring that they're not cross securitizing where possible, as well as maximizing the ability to actually minimize any of those cash flow positions. So first step, finance structures. Second step, invest. Okay. How are they going with it all? They're happy? I'd like to think so. Yeah. If, it's if, a reason why you use it as a case study. Yeah, absolutely. But- For me, that's absolutely bread and butter. If you can get there on your first, second, or third investment property with decent cash flow, growth market, value add opportunities, minimal outlay, mm. and minimal upkeep. If I have my time again, and I probably bought majority of my personal investments similar to that when I was building my portfolio a couple of, well, probably well over a decade ago now, mm. is that they are the properties which if you look under the hood of any successful property investor who started from scratch, they've got that stuff. They've got that stuff. And yeah. they will say, you know what, <laughs> give me my time again, I'll buy way more of that stuff. Yeah, I completely agree. It's a good point. So they didn't mind it wasn't in Sydney? Where they Not at all. And somewhere. they were realistic because they knew that the yield was going to be a cutoff for them. It was going to hit their serviceability. They also mm. knew that Sydney wasn't necessarily the be or end all. And the fact that they had their own home there, if Sydney, and it is going on a tear, similar to a lot of the Australian market right now, They've still got exposure there because they had their home already yeah, bought. Yeah. They weren't rent vesting. They weren't saying, oh, I'm going to sit away from Sydney. I'm going to go buy elsewhere. They already had that anchor in Sydney. So if it does continue on a growth cycle, they've got exposure. Their home is their home that they want. Yep. They're not interested in upgrading. Okay. That's good. Is much of that stuff around you? Can you get this stuff in this market? Uh, it's tough. Yeah. It's really tough. I literally just before this podcast, I spent about 20 minutes on the phone to a client who we've been working on for six months. And it's painful for me because we've bought two properties for him, literally got under contract, gone through building and pest and got to the point of subsidence in both of them. Exactly the same thing. We had cracking and brickwork on one corner, was dropping away. We couldn't get them to agree to. It was about a 12, 15K rectification. We weren't comfortable taking on that that property for them and we've walked away from it. And in that time, the market's grown by another six or seven percent. We're still working on it for them. So it hurts me that that's happening in one side of things. But when this happens and it's a straight shot and you're like, we bought it, we got it right price, we got the correct scenarios right around it, I'm stoked. More of those. Yeah, my view of this is um, in markets like this, a lot of people say buyer's agents are good in markets where there's more properties for sale than what there is buyers, right? Because they can really good negotiating and all that sort of stuff, right? That's fair enough and um, it's a good point. However, if you don't buy well and time you're buying well in this market, if you miss out on a property for whatever reason and you try again in a month's time, potentially you're looking at 3 4 5% in this market higher. So you know, it's not all about how much you can screw down a vendor in this market. No. It is paying fair market value for a property. 
Absolutely. And getting there before anyone else is prepared yeah. to pay more because yeah. that's what's happening. Yeah. So speed and by. agility speed and- trumps. Yep. Yeah, because in this market, you got a real estate agent. Well, you know, there's a bit of subsidence. I want 50 grand. They're going to go, pass. I've got the next blow. Yeah, unconditional. Yeah. Cash offer. Yeah. Yeah. Happy days. All right, stay with us. We're going to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to chat through Kings Meadow, Launceston. Back in a moment. Are you struggling to invest in property this year and need help buying? Then you need to book in a consultation with Investor's Dream and let us do the hard work for you. Don't fall victim to missing out on incredible deals like everyone else. Lock in a meeting today. Go to investorsdream.com.au and secure your financial freedom today. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show with uh, Director of Pure Property Investment, Paul Glossop, uh, regular guest on the show, going through three case studies, recent case studies, buying property. It's three different price points in the market. Now, Longceston, regional. It's a, is it regional or metropolitan? It's regional, but it's a big regional town. It's the right? second biggest, yeah, second biggest second, market. Second biggest in, market in, but it's a regional town. Yeah, correct. Tell us about it, mate. Sort of, I'm going to ask you the same sort of questions. So um, what was it? Why they buy it? How much was it? What are you going to do with it? What would you like in it? What's the yield in it? What's the end game? Yeah. It's been so let's start with the client. Yeah, so the client, um, it's funny, I actually met with this client this morning and we went through a portfolio review. So this property that we bought for the actually properties that we bought for them, they've got already in their portfolio three separate investments. Their goal is eight assets or circa three and a half to four million dollars, depending on the yield. We've got a commercial or potentially two commercial properties we're going to look at including in their portfolio later in the build. They're looking at 180 grand as their total income. They're about halfway there already. They've got their principal place of residence paid off. They've got three investments already with a circa sort of 60% LVR, relatively highly cash flow positive already at about that 90 grand. They're probably more blue chip. We're looking at adding properties which are going to be higher cash flow, but also value add potential. This particular property in this market, Kings Meadow, for anyone who doesn't know it, it's a suburb of Launceston. Launceston, well, even in this last 12 months, has grown about 11%. Capital growth. That's it, though. There's no more growth. No more growth. No more growth. You I, missed it. I'm pretty sure you and I were having this conversation it's about be four years ago. We were years. buying heaps in Hobart <laughs> at the time. Yeah. And I think that was the headline, heaps in Hobart, and a little alliteration that we ran with for a little while there. But to be fair, the intention of this property is it's two separate. It's about a just short of a 1,200 square meter block. It is literally a battle axe scenario where it's a house at the front, house at the back, not a granny flat, nothing to that effect. I actually bought it and built it separate times. The property is not subdivided from a strata or torrens, but can be. So the distance is there about 600 square, just short of 600 square meter blocks each. And we bought both properties for just shy of 500 grand. So both properties just shy of 500 grand, both tenanted. Again, similar scenario where we had this actually teed up for about the last nine or 10 months. The owners themselves were just looking at liquidating, taking cash. COVID put a pause on it. We're actually going to buy it around about March, April last year. It didn't end up happening. Everything sort of petered off and we ended up securing it about a month and a half ago. We're settled on it very relatively recently. The particular properties themselves, they are three bedders, both three bedders, similar three bed, one bath, one car garage, short of 600 square meters each. The total rent on the properties I've got in front of me here is $680 a week. And to be fair, that's probably under-rented. It mm. probably should be around about $750 a week if they actually upped it, which is in all likelihood in the next 12 months where it will be. But the intention of these over that same process is they'll probably look at some stage strata titling or torrents titling. They can actually torrents or strata depending on what they want to do on contributions. They probably won't do it until the exit phase, but that's at that stage. They're probably going to look at cutting it in half and potentially selling one keeping one unencumbered. And there's already, from what we're doing on data, freestanding house in that particular market, you wouldn't get anything in Kings Meadow for less than probably around about 320, 330, regardless whether it's battle axe, full street fronted, et cetera. So the cost to do that is about 25K. Mm. If you look at council contributions and a few other things they're going to have to add to the properties to get them to actually separate titles, we see that they've probably banked in about 70K in equity from the purchase, and it's about eight or nine grand a year cash flow positive. Okay, quick one. Torrens title is what? So essentially freestanding freehold, no contributions, nothing that's associated with any other properties. And strata, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's attached. It means that it's essentially part of a strata title. And it doesn't necessarily also mean that strata title, people's mind typically waves straight to, oh, you've got contributions, you've got body corp, you've mm-hmm. got yeah, you know, all kinds of common areas, et cetera. You do have a common driveway in this instance, but there is no financial upkeep. 
So yeah. you set it initially in this instance, there are two houses. Once it's strata titled, effectively, that's where the cost is. There is no ongoing contributions. There's no costs. There's nothing that yeah, will be associated get, it, with this. It's only if you have multiple owners. Multiple owners, common strata, areas, yeah, which common areas. need upkeep. And then obviously things like gyms, lifts, pools, which are in strata titled unit complexes or townhouses, that's when you obviously have ongoing costs. Yeah. We've got a block of flats or I guess you call it a block of flats in, in Launton. Uh, in right? Launton. Yeah. And they're strata. They're all individually yep. titled, right? You know, and, and strata. But there's no strata upkeep because- no. It's yours. We, we, we did a lot. We've got to pay to get the bloody lawns done and the yeah. gardens weeded, but that's about the extent of it, right? Yeah. And when the kids hang off the hills hoist and bend the, uh, the arm, got to get it fixed kids. up as hills well. Hills supposed to be indestructible though, right? Yeah. The, you know the new ones aren't that good? Oh, my aluminium. Aluminium. That's the problem. So good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can, they can only- <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm thinking. I won't go there. Okay. So the client's happy with the outcome? Are they going, oh, Tasmania, lawn system? What? Where are they based? They're based on the Gold Coast. They're on the Mermaid Waters. Okay. But they've got assets already in Brisbane. Um, we've actually bought a separate asset from them in North Brisbane prior to this one. Yeah. And they've got some exposure elsewhere as well. So this is one of a number of other purchases. Yeah. Personally, I'm not convinced with with Hobart and Tasmania. Yeah. I just, How long have you been saying that for, Phil? Five, six years. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And if you bought in Hobart, you want to bring it up as we're live on yeah. air. If you, if you yeah. bought in Hobart, yeah. let's go with- For $200,000? No, let's yeah. go five or six. 20% growth, I've you, got forty grand. Well, it depends on what you pay. So how about Tasmania? If we speak live on air, five-year growth, 61.8%. Yeah. And median price at that time, Hobart CBD or Hobart as in the postcode 7,000 yeah. was average price was $530,000. I see a graph, go, go back 10 years from the start of that graph. Okay, so we go flat. back 10 years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if you bought five years ago yeah. as we're speaking, exactly. Go back 20 years and be flat. It's not. <laughs> so if you actually truly, and this is for listeners, a good little exercise. If you bought in Hobart in 2000, mm. And if you compared it to any other market around Australia, the only real close market that is going to compare you to this equivalent growth is Melbourne. Yeah. There you go. You're on the payroll of the- uh- <laughs> <laughs> Cut it out. Yeah. <laughs> When's the premier going to call next, right? <laughs> and no, I, I joke. Um, no, but I think that's a really good point, Phil, because you can look at data and it can prove anything at any point in time. And, and that's your point a, there. You know, confirmation bias. Massively. It's that's confirmation exactly bias. what it is. And it comes down to, if you're holding any of these assets for 30 years, to be fair, they're anywhere between, over the last 40 years, between yeah. around about 58 and 7.7% gross capital growth. Yeah. In any of the major markets, it just depends when you buy it. Is really going to dictate and, when you saw the yeah, absolutely. Growth. And and timing is key, and time in the market is also key. But you speak to anyone if they've held property for longer than twenty years, unless you've bought an absolute lemon. Yep. And, and there is some around. Absolutely. Hashtag mining towns ten years ago. Yep. Most people can go. Hey, yeah, I've done pretty well. Yeah. Absolutely. And and therein lies the opportunity of investing in property as an asset class. All right. When we come back, Woolaware, the great, is it a suburb? Woolaware? 100% it's a The great suburb of Woolaware back in a moment. Whether you're an avid property investor or about to buy your first property, why do it alone when you could partner with Australia's best buyer's agent, Director of Pure Property Investment, Property Investment Professionals of Australia board member and REB Buyer's Agent of the Year, Paul Glossop, can take your portfolio to the next level. Get in touch today to discuss your investment goals. Get one-on-one insight from Paul Glossop. And for the first 100 people, this service is completely free. Head to purepropertyinvestment.com today to schedule your consult with Paul Glossop directly. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show with Paul Glossop, Director of Pure Property Investment. Three case studies in this market, Woolaware, which is uh, you got to drive over Tom Ugly's Bridge. Captain Cook Bridge. Captain Cook. Are you a Tom Ugly's Bridge or Captain Cook Bridge man? Uh, if I'm coming here, mm. I am a Captain Cook Bridge. Okay. Yeah. Tom Ugly's is... For my mum, if she's going to yeah. come out and visit, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, should take the M five. When are they going to like get a better bridge over there? They a bit rickety. That, well, I'm pretty that. sure they're building the F six, which is a no, tunnel. They- Don't worry about bridges; <laughs> we're going under. They deliberately probably keep those uh, bridges as they are to try and keep the riffraff out well, from the, the north, out, right? Well, yeah, hundred percent. Well, anyway, Kira Billy, our Kira prime Billy minister riffraff. seems to like that part of the world, so it yep. can't be too bad. But mm-hmm. um, you seem not. He's from Woolaware. He's in this where his family home is. Oh, I think he's over. It's close to there. Lily Pilly. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's about five minutes from where yeah. I, well, where this property is. Yeah, yep. Woolaware. So um. Woolaware is it's a suburb of the Shire. It's not yep. like the glitz and glamour of uh, of Cronulla Central, but it's not as uh, probably not as considered from the lower suburbs there, like which would be um, the oil refiner area. It's probably not too hot there, but uh, no, it's it's actually bonkers in Cronulla. It's going nuts. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the Caltex refinery's gone, been stitched up for a couple of years now, so that yeah. actually no longer exists. That's turning into pretty high end industrial and 
as well as some very nice residential in that area. Well, there's, what's the suburb along? So if you're going at Kurnell, mm. along the Botany Bay there on the left-hand side, what's mm-hmm. that suburb? In Kurnell itself. Is that Kurnell itself? There's a lot of old sort of like fibro. Yeah, they're not so, anymore. No, Next that, time that, you're that's got to be pretty. That strip, which is uh, Silver Beach. Silver if Beach. Because yeah, it's right Bay. under the flight path. Yeah, but to be fair, COVID's been amazing for that area because yeah, very little planes flying overhead. And it's probably got one of the best views in Sydney if you actually were looking at it. Oh, it's brilliant. You look back over the whole of the city. Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Just yeah, might, don't mind the, the 747s, which are decommissioned. But no more 747s. No more 747s, 747s at least. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, Singapore Airlines just dusted off one of their A380s out of Adelaide. Uh, right. It's flown it back out uh, to try and get it refitted in brand new stuff. So the A380s Making a are comeback. back. They're Retro. Back. You heard it. They love it. A380s, but anyway, this is not an aviation no, podcast. No, it's not. And, and I really don't want it to It sometimes involved. surprised me, the useless pieces of information that I sometimes have. What does that it mean? It doesn't surprise me. <laughs> what is the what is the uh, the reissuance of the Singapore Airlines A380s mean for property markets <laughs> in the Silver Beach area of Sydney? <laughs> you want noise is up. No, noise is up. Dust is down. Dust is down, but... Um, <laughs> Tell me about Woolaware. You like Woolaware. You like this area. Oh, look. It's a different price point, right? It's so, a different Okay, it's so a we're talking uh, Ka- Kalangar is, what was it, 300 odd grand, right? Yeah, 335. Yeah. yeah, something to that effect. And sort of top and tail of uh, Woolaware is a suburb, houses. Yep. Where's your entrance? You, you can't enter into that market, unfortunately, now. I'd like to think this example that I'm going to say is entry. Mm. Yeah, that's your entry. It, basically, your high one millions is basically entry now. High one millions. High one millions. Oof. Yeah, okay. you're talking for a knockdown, high one millions now. And where does it top out? It'll top out for a, a house that can't be developed into anything else that's mm. architectural and everything else with it, high twos. Okay. Mm. All right. Yeah. It's representative of a middle upper suburb in Sydney these days. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, okay. definitely. That's right. Yeah. So, so call it top 40%. Yeah, probably yeah. even more. Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right, yeah. good. Give us a case study. So this is a particular client who already has a couple of assets. They run a business and they've got a very successful business. They've been running their business for quite some time, have really good disposable income, no debt on their home. They've got a couple other investments with no debt. They've got very good borrowing capacity and a lot of liquidity. And you can see here by these examples where for me to go to that person and say, let's go buy a $335,000 asset in Kalanga, not to say that's going to be doing them a disservice, but to be fair, there's a certain level of time and effort that you need to put into property, which to be fair, that particular client, I don't personally think it's necessary. Mm. And I think they're at the level where they're saying, look, I want to get active. Not necessarily I want to become a developer because they just don't need to be, but they want to be able to manufacture growth and they want to be able to invest in assets at the correct time, at the correct property, et cetera. So they're looking at properties which they can add value to. And we actually bought another property for this client in Brisbane at the same time, which is a corner block, two separate assets with similar dynamics. But- this particular property was an off-market and anyone who's familiar with the Sydney market right now, finding an off-market asset, especially exclusive owner-occupied uh, suburbs. Define off-market because there's a lot of conjecture around this right off-market now. Off-market is I got a phone call from an agent who I've dealt with and probably bought two dozen properties with over the last two years, including a development site that I personally worked on. They gave me a call and said, Paul, I've just got them signed up. They're looking at buying this other property that I've got listed. They're going to go to auction for that. They've got no debt on this home, but they can't borrow a penny because they're retired they need to sell that to be able to buy this. So it's not a pre-platform listing. It is zero platform listing. So it's never even got to do I could give the address, I won't for for privacy reasons, but this property would never have seen the light of day regardless. So genuine off-market. Genuine off-market. Because a lot of people think, oh, yeah, genuine off-market, they get it before they actually list it on real estate. And it will never be listed. And the only place this actually saw any listing was on this actual agent's Instagram profile saying, hey, I just sold this property. If you're looking at blah, 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 blah. Okay. Just that standard. I could easily tell you who, ask you who the agent is right now, but you won't tell me that. I won't tell you that. Okay, fine. No, All right, no. good. How much? So, what is the It's a house? It was a house. So, it's good a house, house. Bad house, indifferent uh, house? Average house, I would classify. It's not dilapidated, it's mm. very rentable. So, the numbers around it, we bought it for 1.935. The property itself is a classic cash complex buyer. Or? No, they're going to leverage. The they're going to okay. definitely leverage because yeah. they want to maximize their borrowing capacity. Okay. So, definitely, definitely leverage. 690 odd square meter block, purely rectangular, a bit over 15 meter frontage. It's a CDC duplex site, which for anyone who's listening in saying, what the hell does that mean? Laws changed to New South Wales planning very recently where duplex sites, if they fit specific algorithms of density as well as frontages and minimum setbacks, et cetera, can go through what's called a CDC 
approval as opposed to full council approval and what that means. Compliant development certificate? Correct. Okay. So you're going through a private certifier and an architect as opposed to spending six months in council to get it approved. So to be fair, this client's already starting the process of that CDC approval. So you get this private certifier to sign off the plan saying, if you build it per that spec, I'll sign it off and then that'll go to the council and they'll go, well, that guy's literally, certified. There's it. nothing for council to do. They just literally tick and lodge. <clears throat> and there is a, you hear a lot of discussion around this, around local councils. Some local councils are better than other local councils and some are enablers for development and others aren't enablers for development. And I would highlight- Waverly. Waverly. Leichhardt, for Leichhardt. example, being considered Classic. as hard to get stuff through, whereas other people, easy to get stuff through. Yep. And a lot of it would be determined by who the mayor is and who the local yep. sort of constituents are, which yep. way they lean in terms of their yep. political, uh, whether they're left or right. So when you're going down this part, if you're going to look at this sort of stuff, it really depends where you're doing it. Massively. Really doing it. Massively. And you can't just think that, oh, you go do this in Sutherland Shire, then all of a sudden this applies to mm. the Leichhardt Council. So Sutherland Shire is pretty good. Well, to be fair, not really. Okay. I mean, it just, they're black and white. And the beauty about CDC or what fits and doesn't fit is mm. that it's very easy. If you've got a good, i.e., a, a buyer's agent and a town planner who can understand the numbers and figure out what this actually means and is this a yes or a no via CDC, it's not complicated. Mm. It's literally a conversation to go through it, go into our planning tools, say yes or no. And then from there, you've got an outcome. So 1.935 purchase price, CDC approval. They're going through that process. Realistically, that should be approved in the next six weeks. Their intention is to build it straight away. They're going to hold. They don't want to sell. We're looking at a fixed price build cost from our comparisons in this particular market of about without a pool, which I think they're going to do one with a pool, one without a pool. So we'll call it straight down the middle, about 1.2 mil is going to be their construction costs. So they bought for 1.935, call it 2 million after all said and done, maybe a touch over, 2 million 50. They're going to build for 1.2. They're also going to borrow about 100K closings. So we're talking around about, where's our numbers there? We're talking about 3.3, 3.4. If we're talking about what it's actually going to cost them to realize this property in 12 months time, about a nine month build program and they're going to hold. Comparable sales for four bed, three bath, one car garage with separate driveways in that particular pocket will sell for 1.95 to 2 mil in that time. We expect they'll be around about those numbers. Hmm, is the juice worth the squeeze? Well, it's five to seven hundred thousand dollars. Free. Well, it's not free. What? <laughs> free I, I charge them a fee. I can assure you of that. No, no, no. <laughs> so that, does that include your your fee? Yeah, hundred percent. Our fee is yeah. always a flat fee, and this is where it comes out. So, of but I'm saying, but, so the upside is half a million bucks, right? The six hundred minimum, bucks. yeah. And our job is to connect them with mm-hmm. all those other people to get all these outcomes there. But they're actually going to tenant it for the first six months. The property's going to rent. It's already on the market right now for rent. For, I think it's about to hit the mm. the portals about eight fifty nine hundred a week. Yeah, it's so they're going to flog it when they're done with it. No, I think they're going to hold. Okay. they'll rent for about twelve hundred, thirteen hundred a week yeah. each. Yeah. So there's actually going to be about a four percent yield on completion. But the market as it goes through the tear, this is a client who can't afford to hold, and they're looking at building a larger asset base. Okay, and the whole period is going to be less than a year to get this done? I would say 12 months, so yeah, is about expectation maybe, maybe from three months from case, design yeah. to approval, nine-month construction, and then tenants. So, so your numbers don't factor in uplift in the market? No, not you're, in you're that You're basing instance. that on the current market? Current market okay. now, we try to factor that in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. You yeah. get some upside in there. Okay, so that's a sort of different end. And from the client base that you operate within, how many of them operate at the Kalunga level? How many operate at that sort of Kings Meadow two block type level? And how many sort of are operating at Woolaware? It's probably about a 60, 30, 10. Okay. Yeah, I'd expect it. Which probably- I'd expect it to be because yeah. not many investors can operate in that. No chance. You know. No, and for obvious reasons. And you know, this wasn't a client who was – the, the, the higher end clients, not someone who just came along and said, "Oh, I've just had this windfall." They've, mm. they've worked their tails off for the last twenty years to get yeah. to this point, and they've they've earned a lot of money as well as built a very successful business and invested elsewhere to actually get to that position. Some of the investors who are in the early stages, they're starting. And to be fair, I've seen Got plenty start. start. Yeah, Mate, I saw one of your first properties. Yeah, yeah, I think you did physically. I, <laughs> I did. I did hold a paintbrush, and I think I saw one of your first as well. And I'm pretty sure I held a paintbrush there as well. Yes, this is the way it works. <laughs> but um, anyway, okay, they're really good, Paul. Uh, thanks for those uh, cases. If you like this sort of stuff, um, and you don't really get a lot of this, no. you know. And if you do, someone's normally lying when you see these uh, how I become a bazillionaire overnight type mm. stories. So this isn't bazillionaire overnight type stuff. You know, I'd like to think, to my point when we started this, that we're the voice of reason and sensibility, you yep. know, and, and hence the reason why I asked you 
for some three real world case studies, and I think you've done a pretty fair interpretation of them. What I'd like, if you can provide me the numbers and we can do a story online, that'd yeah. be cool. Yeah, yeah um, for sure. Without giving anything away. Go and check it out. When it's up, we'll let you know. Smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Uh, Paul, thanks for your time today. Oh, you're welcome, mate. Really it's good. good fun. Remember, Smart Property HQ is social media, if that's where you uh, like to get your info. Uh, if you're not yet subscribing, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au forward slash subscribe. And please, if you like what we're doing, um, I'd like to think, and it would appear that this would be the collective sentiment that what we're doing here is in the uh, the best interest of property investors. So if you like what we're doing, I really appreciate and the team in particular those reviews wherever you're listening to this uh, podcast right now. Let us know what you think, what we're doing, and uh, happy to turn it up, change it, evolve it to better suit you. Get in touch. We'll make sure we'll make it happen. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.